Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, giving an update on ending the uh, federal conflict uh, in Hawaii. Um, as, as Brent mentioned, this is something that I've been working on for about the past uh, eight years. And there have been some recent developments that, that I wanted to share. Um, first of all, thanks to Hawaii Cannabis Organization and, and, and Brent Norris for everything you guys are doing to raise awareness on this subject. I, I have to congratulate you on really putting together a, a great uh, team of speakers today. Uh, I thought I'd be able to watch Alice uh, O'Leary's presentation first and break away for some household chores, and I, and I haven't really been able to peel myself away, so I really appreciate that quality of uh, presentations today. Um, and so just a couple of disclosures. Um, I am a certifying physician for Hawaii's medical cannabis program. I am not a member or a consultant for any dispensary, and I have no other financial disclosures to make. Uh, this presentation is really for educational purposes. I'm not a lawyer, and so I always recommend that, that patients who have questions uh, and need legal advice on the medical use of, of cannabis in Hawaii consult with a legal professional who has expertise in this area. Um, just a little background on myself. I uh, have been seeing patients and doing certifications for Hawaii's program since about 2013. Uh, my clinic has had different names, but currently I'm calling it Akamai Cannabis Clinic, and I am a certified cannabinoid medicine specialist through the board of the American Academy of uh, Cannabinoid Medicine. I also wanted to mention that I was on the uh, initial Hawaii Dispensary Task Force. Um, as well on that task force, I think it's important to note that our uh, recommendations that were would be that Hawaii set up a horizontally integrated system so that uh, production and distribution could be uh, could be of benefit throughout the community. And instead, we ended up with a vertical system that was decided upon uh, behind closed doors, essentially. And it's part of the reason why we're facing the problems we are today. Um, Hawaii's Medical Use of Cannabis Act um, was enacted in 2000 uh, as a result of actually two legislative sessions that finally culminated in the, in the passage of Senate Bill 862. Um, signed into law by Governor Cayetano on June 14th, going into effect on June 28, 2000. Here, here's his signature on that bill. I always like to go back to the original documents. And this was really a significant event for Hawaii uh, in terms of using a state using the legislative process to accept the medical use of cannabis. And so that, um, that law was um, uh, placed within Hawaii's Uniform Controlled Substances Act, which is anything but uniform, under Chapter 329. And that's why we get this, this funny term of the 329 card. But anyway, under Part 9, you will see the title Medical Use of Cannabis. And I want to point out that this does not say medicinal use of cannabis. It doesn't even say botanical use of cannabis. It very clearly says medical use of cannabis, which has very specific implications on the federal regulation of marijuana. And uh, as Brent mentioned, I am the founder of Medical Cannabis Day, which I started in 2019, uh, as a way to honor our patients and uh, bring awareness to this current situation that really needs to change. And uh, as you know, this year we celebrated 20 years of accepted medical use in Hawaii. I think it's helpful to go back to the original intent of our state lawmakers. And this comes from the original bill uh, introduction that was later changed. Um, but we can see here, the legislature further finds that allowing the medical use of marijuana could promote Hawaii as being an international center for medical treatment and research. And I, I think that's really quite visionary on the part of our state lawmakers at that time and something I think we should still strive for. But what happened when Hawaii decided that cannabis has medical use, it, it created a conflict between the federal regulation of the non-medical use of marijuana and the state authorized medical use of cannabis in Hawaii. And a lot of people say our program violates federal law, but if you look at, at federal laws, as Carl Olson so clearly pointed out, um, the federal statute it says that a substance can't be in Schedule One if it has accepted medical use. The conflict is really with the regulation, the actual rule that is being unconstitutionally applied to our medical cannabis program. And, um, you know, I, I I always try and go back to the people who made those decisions at the time. And um, when I communicated with Governor Cayetano about this, he, he told me that they really didn't want to go ahead and consult with the Department of Justice or DEA. They decided not to because they figured they would just say no. And 
maybe they figured that they would go ahead with the program, knowing about the state's uh, sovereign authority to decide on the medical use of, of controlled substances in the state and see if they did anything. And actually they did nothing. This was way before the Cole memos. The Department of Justice did not uh, challenge the legality of our medical cannabis program. But I think an important step that was missed was going back to the Department of Justice and saying, hey guys, we have determined that cannabis has medical use. We need to sort this out so that there isn't a conflict that's going to be hurting our patients. And, and of course, this was before uh, Gonzalez versus Oregon in 2006. So it might not have been that clear at that point how to go about solving this conflict. But as a result, we had this kind of uh, passive acceptance of our program by law, uh, local and state law enforcement, which has really caused uh, a lot of discrimination uh, against our uh, lawfully registered uh, cannabis patients in the state and has created an attitude where there really isn't a lot of respect uh, for our medical cannabis program. In this instance, I think history really matters. And um, I think uh, contrasting Iowa and Hawaii is, is a very helpful thing to do um, because uh, perhaps Iowa is going to be an example of how a state can actually do it right. And I think Hawaii is an example, a great example of, of how to mess it up and really perpetuate discrimination against our patients. So I'm going to approach this from a patient-centric point of view as a uh, medical cannabis clinician. And I have patients call me up almost on a weekly basis telling me about uh, injuries and discriminations that they're running into. And a big one is finding employment, especially right now, where you have to undergo a pre-employment drug screening test. And this is based on the federal drug-free workplace policy, which requires uh, no impairment uh, from drugs on the, uh, in the workplace. But what they use is a uh, urine drug screening test that can be positive for weeks for our patients and does not allow for the accurate determination of whether uh, a, uh, an employee is using cannabis uh, in the workplace and certainly should not be applied to state authorized patients who are legally using cannabis for their qualifying conditions. Um, I had a patient recently who got a job with the United Service, United States Postal Service and had to answer this on, online questionnaire before their uh, contracts finalized, which makes them reveal whether they have used cannabis at all during the past year, even if authorized under state laws, kind of like that little change that the ATF did to firearms permits. And so what does the patient do? You know, if they, if they answer uh, truthfully, as I would uh, recommend, then they could potentially lose that, that uh, employment. Um, the other issue is uh, child custody hearings. Um, we have um, parents who are battling for the custody of their children in uh, unpleasant divorce proceedings and being discriminated against because sometimes their other significant, significant other will say, oh, well, they use cannabis and, and the judge won't always recognize state authorized medical use. Uh, how about keeping employment? As I already mentioned, uh, random drug tests are becoming more prevalent in the state, especially uh, with new agreements being negotiated by some of our larger uh, unions. Uh, if you get selected for a random drug screening test and you test positive, you could very possibly be terminated, even though you're using cannabis legitimately under medical supervision and not using it at work. What we really need for this kind of situation is a test designed to measure uh, cannabis use uh, acutely, like a breath THC breathalyzer that's currently under development. Or how about a pilot for a commercial airline who uh, has been flying for decades and um, cannot tolerate the opioids and all the other medications and uh, really needs cannabis to do their job. Uh, again, potentially subjected to random drug testing and termination. Uh, patients applying for life insurance or temp temporary disability insurance. This is a picture, of course, of a, of a building that's burnt down, but I think it exemplifies the fact that the, the house is on fire here. Our patients are being injured daily, and something needs to be done about it. Home protection is also a big uh, issue for a lot of our patients, especially on the Big Island. Regardless of your personal feeling towards firearms, we have patients in remote areas of the Big Island with uh, 
ex significant others who are violating uh, TROs and whose lives are potentially at danger, who really need some type of home protection, or patients who uh, part of their livelihood is based upon hunting. Uh, how about federally subsidized housing, patients who are being evicted if it's discovered that they're using cannabis legally under state law, or a big one, inter island transport, um, where patients are being told that it's against federal law to transport cannabis to other islands within our state. And we tried to rectify the situation during the 2019 uh, legislative session of HB 290, uh, which would have specifically protected and put in procedures in place to allow inter-island transport of medical cannabis by patients. And this made it all the way to the governor's desk and was vetoed with the reason that it violated federal law, even in the face of a federal aviation regulation that specifically exempts the transport of marijuana aboard aircraft um, from federal restrictions if it's authorized under state law. Uh, as I mentioned, um, there's also intra-island transport uh, issues on the Big Island because of the way that Hawaii Volcano, uh, Volcanoes National Park and the uh, Pohaku Loa training area are laid out across our uh, Big Island uh, major roads. And of course, another major issue is uh, research in this state. We have a beautiful state-of-the-art research center at the UH Cancer Center that uh, cannot be involved in any type of research with cannabis, even using uh, commercially available laboratory standards of CBD and THC to test against uh, patient samples of cancer cells that can be grown out in the lab and tested against different concentrations and ratios of, of cannabinoids. And so um, I wanted to take a look at how many patients are be being affected by this. And uh, back in August 2015, when the Department of Health took over the program, we had uh, maybe about 11,000 patients. It's nearly tripled in the past five years, which is understandable given the uh, acceptance by the, the community of the medical use of cannabis and, and the emergence of dispensaries. But as this continues to increase, that means more patients who are going to be subjected to all these different forms of discrimination that could be prevented. And so I've found it helpful to take a look at who the stakeholders are, who could potentially move this issue forward. And of course, our patients uh, are the ones who are being directly affected, but um, patients are doing everything they can and using all of their time just to make it through the day. They're dealing with, with complex and chronic medical issues, often financial issues that make it very difficult for them to attend hearings or write letters to their state lawmakers or that kind of stuff. So I think as medical professionals, we really have a responsibility to help them in this area. How about other certifying providers, uh, those in direct contact with our patients in clinic? Uh, honestly, I've gotten very little support from my colleagues in this area, and, and it's rather disappointing. How about our dispensaries, who you think would have a, a vested interest in this issue uh, because they're being considered continuing criminal enterprises uh, by the IRS and are paying exorbitant uh, federal uh, taxes because they can't deduct their standard business expenses? Again. Uh, too busy to address this uh, issue. Uh, I thought it was interesting to look at some of the Hawaii officials who were uh, state lawmakers at the time that our uh, Medical Use of Cannabis Act uh, made it to the uh, governor at Cayetano's desk. And we have some very powerful individuals that are still remaining. Uh, seven state lawmakers, one of who is the Speaker of the House, uh, one of our congressmen uh, who's actively involved at the federal level, and even our governor, who, who could certainly address this issue if he uh, had a desire to do so. Uh, recent governors that I've uh, tried to interact with, starting with Governor Lingle towards the end of her uh, term, we had really high expectations that Governor Abercrombie would make a difference in, and really saw nothing besides uh, kind of a, 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 a somewhat uh, supportive uh, letter of the Rhode Island Washington petition that was fish, uh, submitted back in 2011 that, that really did not recommend, uh, recognize our state's sovereign authority regarding the medical use of cannabis at all. And, and unfortunately, Governor Ige uh, has been uh, nearly completely silent on, on communicating about this issue. Uh, I've been working on this through several uh, attorney generals. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult for the regular citizen to interact with the Office of the Attorney General because they have attorney-client privilege with our state officials and cannot discuss issues such as this. 
um, the, the leadership at, at our state legislature, very powerful people who can uh, influence the topics that the legislature will take up each year. And our Lieutenant Governor, who is uh, uh, from the Big Island, for all you uh, Big Island uh, patients, um, will not address this issue uh, regardless of being a medical doctor. So I, I trying to figure out why all these people who've touched this issue are not willing to step, step up to the plate and help our patients. I, it might come down to this case, Gonzalez versus uh, Reich in 2005, uh, but everyone kind of takes this as well. The issue has been settled. Uh, federal supremacy rules no matter what the situation, but the problem is that this case never addressed the impact of California's Com Compassionate Use Act upon the Controlled Substances Act. And that's the key piece of federalism here that needs to be addressed. Uh, Carl also mentioned Gonzalez versus Oregon, which really substantiated uh, the state's authority to decide on the medical use of cannabis and showed us that the Department of Justice and the DEA cannot use rules to declare such use uh, invalid. So um, as Carl Olson also pointed out, um, there are these processes in place. So why is this so difficult? Uh, the exemption process under uh, CFR 1307.03, it actually lays out an administrative process for getting an exemption. Uh, the uh, exemption, uh, I'm sorry, the, yes, the existing exemption for members of the Native American church who can engage in the ceremonial use of peyote, a schedule one controlled substance without violating federal laws or regulations. So, um, and we have this beautiful uh, federal exemption action that's pending from Iowa. I love uh, the motto on their state seal, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. Perhaps that explains some of their willingness to address this issue. And I just wanted to thank Carl Olson for all his work in this area and for the education and insights he's provided on state sovereignty and the interaction of, of state and federal regulation of controlled substances. So we tried to address this issue last session with a uh, federal exemption bill that was introduced by uh, Russell Ruderman, uh, who decided on, uh, to retire from uh, state service. But uh, this would have uh, put in place something similar that, that Iowa uh, may be working on to um, obtain, a, obtain recognition for uh, uh, the accepted medical use of cannabis in Hawaii by means of a Schedule I exemption. And unfortunately, this bill died early on in the session last year. Uh, our, the Office of our Attorney General provided uh, formal guidance that I think was quite lacking. And unfortunately, the chair uh, at that time took that advice and issued some false statements that were used to kill this bill without much discussion at all. So my recent uh, activity has been trying to uh, interact with our new director of health, Director Char, uh, who certainly came uh, into this role under difficult situations. But uh, this photo was taken from her first public appearance on her first day in that role. And she made a very interesting comment that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to our health beyond COVID. And um, I took that as an opportunity to begin correspondence and a discussion with her. And unfortunately, there is still a lot of administrative bureaucracy present within the Department of Health that's, that's making it challenging to change attitudes within that department. Uh, you, many of you probably know there are three uh, petitions to add uh, debilitating conditions to Hawaii's program, anxiety, depression, and insomnia that the Department of Health is currently reviewing. These are pretty broad topics and could add significant numbers of patients to our program. But even if the department does not approve these uh, conditions, I believe they have a, a role and an obligation under their mission to protect the health and welfare of our medical cannabis patients to take some action on this issue. So what are our next steps? Uh, I believe we need to do a little reflection and see um, what we can do to go forward that will be strategically effective. And I've tried to leave um, some breadcrumbs bread along the way about things that might have potential work, things that haven't worked? Uh, do we just keep in the background and, and accept the status quo and continue uh, as things are now? Or do we step forward and, and really take hold of our right, of patients' rights to engage in the legitimate uh, state authorized medical use of cannabis? Organization is something that could be effective, but it's very challenging. It requires having a unified voice and, and a single mission 
uh, that can be followed uh, without deviation. And uh, as a medical doctor, I'm in this just for the medical use. Uh, we've seen a lot of distractions from this effort because of a desire to jump to recreational legalization. And, and I think that is a mistake. I think we need to fix our medical program first and prove that we can take care of our patients. And this approach of getting recognition from the federal government, getting an exemption may actually provide a pathway for broader uh, state authorized use in the future if it's done properly. So uh, on, on closing, I just wanted to uh, briefly mention a, a Vedantic spiritual tale that many of you may have heard about a, a lion that's raised from a cub by, by a flock of sheep, it grows up believing that it's actually a sheep until a fellow lion comes along and pulls it over to a lake and shows, you, shows that lion its reflection in the water and instantly the lion knows that it's a lion and, and accepts who it is or who she is. And this is very similar to where we are now. Uh, accepted medical use, state authorized medical use already exists. Our state has the authority to determine that. This is not something we need to ask for or get somebody else or some other agency to tell us that it's medical use. But we do need to get some type of acknowledgement so that we can remove this unnecessary conflict that is causing so much discrimination with our patients. Uh, there are some federal changes ahead, and I would say regardless of what happens at the federal level, whether there is um, some rescheduling in store, uh, our medical cannabis program is completely separate from FDA-approved drug products. And so it will always remain separate, which means that we need to protect our medical cannabis program and our state's authority to decide how uh, cannabis will be used for medical purposes or for other purposes within the state. We are in a very unique situation uh, as a island state where the intrastate medical use of cannabis could be used uh, and perhaps satisfy the vision of the original drafters of our medical cannabis use uh, act to promote Hawaii as a international center for cannabis research and state-of-the-art uh, treatment. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention and I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you.